Hello and welcome to another episode of Can't Stop the Growth. I'm your host, Chad Peterman, and I am super excited to bring on our guest today, uh, a guy that I met probably roughly about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, We were introduced by a colleague, and from the minute that we started talking, knew that there were a lot of things that we were going to agree upon. And we had a great conversation then. Uh, We've since had some good conversations, and I'm excited to bring him on the podcast to learn a little bit more about his leadership philosophy and the way that uh, he too is really um, changing our industry as a whole. Without any further ado, we'd like to welcome Blake Baer, the president of Ridgeline Electrical Industries. Welcome to the podcast, Blake. Yeah, Chad, thanks for having me on, man. It's exciting. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Blake's got his own podcast as well, um, which I'll uh, we'll definitely plug at the end here uh, so you can check that out. A lot of great content on there. I was listening uh, to a few episodes getting prepared for this. But uh, to start out, Blake, why don't you give us a little bit of your story, how you got into the trades and uh, what, you're, what you're up to now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so did not want to be in the trades. That's kind of how things start, right? As uh, awesome. <laughs> you have your own plans and the plans were, you know, I'm just going to go to college and uh, come out making bank and uh, no problems in the world, no tension in life. And that's just not the way things were for me. So uh, my path was I went the college path and uh, it did not fit. It did not land. Uh, I went to be a pastor. And if you met me for more than uh, 10 minutes, you know, that was a good choice not to. And so uh, <laughs> then I I was like, went into business finance, said, I'm never going to do this stuff. Uh, and then ended up getting a job as a pastor and said, okay, I don't want this to provide for me fully. So I'm going to get a trade as well. And so when I did that, I got into the electrical field and honestly, I fell in love with it because it was a way to be a minder and a grinder to use the hands and use the brain at the same time to come to conclusions. So I I really connected with the trade and then just started eating up, uh, eating it up as I, as I grew, I got into development and training and have taught at uh, our trade association for about 10 years Um, on the board there now and on the national apprenticeship and training committee. And I'm just really passionate about developing people and was working for a, uh, a business and kind of running their operations. It was probably maybe a three to $5 million business and was pretty much running all their operations and just never could have that final say or never in, implement things that I just really believed were supposed to happen. And so it got to such a point that uh, <laughs> my wife was like basically forcing me to quit. She was like, this is just bad. Um, she's like, I don't care that we don't have anything lined up. She didn't have a job. We had at that time, three and a half kids and an overfed dog and mortgage and all those other things. And she was like, life will be better if you get out of this environment. And so, you know, four years ago, that's what we did. We jumped and uh, the rest has been history. That's awesome. A uh, lot of things I want to I want to get into. First off, you know, not every day you hear someone who was going to be a going to be a pastor or actually became a pastor, um, and then is now uh, running an electrical company. What influences would you say from either you know your days as a pastor? Would you say that uh, are utilized today in the in the business, if any? Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think just the focus on people and. Um, I mean, people and culture, right? Your your core values, how to to lead by those things and not just have them be pretty, you know, content that's on your wall that you don't authentically live by, but literally like this is this is the the ground that we're plowing to to grow something. It has to be by these things. And yeah, I, I spent a ton of time developing people and whether that was being a pastor and I wasn't for a very long time. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, that, that was long-term, but developing people and understanding that your people don't know, they don't have the information. They're not perfect yet. It's about developing people. And so once I realized that, that everyone's starting out at zero, (laughs) then that's, it's our responsibility to help them grow to wherever we think they should be. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a fantastic point. And I think it's something that 
you know, as I talk to others in the, in the trades, it's something that has been neglected for a long time. Uh, it's, it's, well, can I train you to be an electrician? Can I train you to be a plumber? Well, like they need that technical skill, no doubt, but are we going to get a better result if we focus on developing better people, not so much just a better plumber? Yeah. Preach it. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that, uh, that I did in, in preparation, and, and I want you to explain this concept because frankly, I've read a ton of books and different stuff like that. And I've never heard this phrase. So I'm excited for you to talk a little bit more about it. In, uh, in your kind of introductory video, which I think is, is really well done with, with uh, Peter and yourself uh, on your website, you talk about horizontal growth for your people, not vertical growth. Explain yeah. that concept to the listeners a little bit. Yeah, so horizontal growth for us, I mean, first off, we knew, let me kind of work back and I'll, I'll get to that for sure. But we knew that especially millennials and Gen Zs, we had to have a focus on a growth path for people and not just saying, here's the place you can grow because that's too ambiguous. That's not giving clarity to your team. And so as we started focusing on that, I realized that um, not only is uh, the ability to grow in the top three reasons why people leave a company, but people are looking for that transparency of what that means. They were looking for like from stage to stage, how does the dollar increase and what are the, the KPIs for them, right? That that is how I get to that place. So through all my reviews, and, I, and I'm sure you've had a ton of reviews with your team where you're, you're going through doing their yearly reviews, quarterlies or whatever. And I saw three things pop up constantly. I saw um, when people were asking for more money, it was usually connected to one, responsibility, two, their growth within the past, whatever the time frame was, and three, their production. And so when we created our growth path plan and growth path, I wanted it to be based on those three things. So the vertical growth is a responsibility-based growth. Um, we have a profit share thing, if you will, that we try to implement based on production. And then the horizontal growth is their growth in themselves to get better in the trade or to, get, to grow in mindset even, like have they understood certain concepts yet? And so we also increase the wage based on that. So that's actually like our baseline is their, their me growth is what we call that. Yeah, I, I think that that is uh, extremely important. I was uh, ha had a meeting last week with um, Aspire Greenwood, which is their kind of economic development body. And, you know, we were talking about how do we how do we connect the schools with the trades? And you know, it started out as most of these conversations do when it comes to the word millennial is how how much can we bash them for mm -hmm. their this and that and they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. And you know, I, I think one of the things that was said in the meeting that was so that was very good was like, hey, let's refocus. Let's understand that these people and you said this earlier. Uh, you know, they all come to you at zero. They all come to us how they are. So we can either sit there and complain about how they are and how they don't fit the way we've always done it, or we can find out what they want and give it to them so it benefits them and it benefits the business. Mm -hmm. What would you say, have you seen kind of the impact of, of focusing <laughs> on that, uh, that me growth, uh, as you put it? Yeah, so you're 100% right when it comes to millennial bashing in the, in the workplace. Um, in fact, that seems like a fun pastime for most people. Yeah. But millennials, I would argue, are some of the most loyal generation, which we don't believe because we see them go in and out of industries very quickly. We see them not stick around. But I think the way to, to hit that loyalty is – to understand that they are one of the most one-parented generation who's still trying to figure it out. Gen Zs, when you look at the Gen Z, which is the under millennials, they are a little more like Gen Xers in that they are just going to go figure shit out kind of thing. Like they're just like, oh, we'll get it figured. Millennials weren't that. They're still like that. I need to be really close and I need to be getting mentored. They were missing a parent for so long. Like the percentage is disgusting. I was, I was teaching one night 
um, I had a, probably a class of 60 people that I was teaching. And uh, I saw that like that glazed over view and that you just lose them. And you're like, oh man, I, I've lost them. And we're only an hour into the night. This is not good. And I, I noticed that and I just said, all right, well, we're going to stir some stuff up. I said, what do you guys think other generations think about you? And all of a sudden everything just lit back up. And it got to such a point that it was like, I saw people welling up in their eyes of just tears of like, they think we don't care and that we don't, we're not loyal. We do, we care deeply. And I was like, "Uh Oh, I didn't mean to go there. So I was like, all right, if you guys are willing here, would you raise your hand if you only came from a household that has, you know, one parent um, or your parents are divorced or whatever. And out of 60, only six did not raise their hand. So that's a massive, disgusting number, but there's opportunity there because people are looking for people to come alongside them and be that mentor. I want to say it was, gosh, I always screw this one up. I'll be honest. It's either Twain or Ford or somebody like that. But they said that man's chief one in life is someone to come alongside them, help them do what they can. Like people want that. They want that person leading them. Look at all our, like just the, uh, structure of a good story has that wise old man or that person that comes alongside. Why do we think this is different? Why do, why do we think that we don't have to be that alongside our team members? Well, you don't, but you're going to have that crappy turnover if you don't. And so building your farm league, building these millennials and Gen Z's and coming alongside them, the loyalty's second to none. I mean, i I'm, I'm working a 4% turnover rate in an industry that's 58% a year. I'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that you hit on so many great things there. And it's, you know, the one that I, we always talk about, and we talk about this with our technicians when it comes to talking with a customer is that the objective is to make the customer the hero of this story. Mm. You are the guide. You have the knowledge, you have the expertise, but it's not you being the hero. I didn't hire you to be the hero. I hired you to ask the right questions and to educate the customer on what it is um, so that they can diagnose their own problem. You know, I, the, the one thing I always tell, you know, technicians, if I get the chance to teach is I bet you guys, especially those guys that have been doing this, like you guys like to fix stuff. But what I'm going to tell you is what I want you to do out there today is I don't want you to fix a damn thing. I want you to have the customer fix their own stuff. And they all right. kind of look at me like with a weird look on their face. Like yep. that's why they called me. I get that. But if you ask all the right questions, guess what a customer can do? They can diagnose their own system and they're going to, and that trust there is built a heck of a lot more than you going out there and your, you know, macho self of like, well, this is your problem. I know what it is. Cause I've been doing this for so long. It's like, yep. ugh. What are some of those things you mentioned, some of the programs that you have and stuff like that? What are you doing, you know, just an example or two specifically to, to grow those people to really connect with that millennial generation? Yeah, so you, you do, you have to grow. Um, we have coaching and training and I separate those and, and the mindset of coaching is focused on the person and training is, co- is focused on their craft because they do have to They have to connect with what they're doing. I don't care. Like people can fit our culture really well um, and then not fit the work. And that's a problem. So we have to find people who fit both and then train them in both. So we our onboarding process or hiring process is extensive. We make sure that we're getting the right person for the right seat. And then we we're not looking like I don't look for electricians. I look to for good people and I will develop the electrical I love what you guys are doing with uh, the top tech school and really developing people to, to the craft there and understanding that we're going to start at ground zero. Um, and so we, we have similar programs. We have a boot camp that's, they don't even go out to the field for an entire week until they've gone through boot camp and they, they actually don't go for two weeks because then we realized after we had our boot camp for the training of the stuff that they're going to do 80% of the time, you know, that 20%, they're going to do 80% of the time in the field. Then we put them through another whole week of production. So showing them how to get quicker, showing them, getting that repetition, that exposure, making sure it's under quality controlled training, because a lot of the training you get out in the field, it's good, but it's usually under fire. And if that's the only way you're learning, 
the only thing fire produces is more fire. So there's got to be a point that you've got to have quality controlled training, making sure they're doing the right things. So we have a whole lot of that up front. Um, we're about to roll out a foreman based training because that's, that's the next thing we see is a big miss um, in our trades. Uh, and then we also do quarterly cultural reviews. We do, I do a monthly call with all of my team, uh, just a 30 minute call where I'm checking in on them, making sure that they're not like that they're, Hey, I want to grow like this this year is actually happening because uh, how many reviews have you been in that you said, Hey, what's your goal for the year? And it's the exact same thing. It was the year before and the year before that. So there was no progress. So the, we do a lot of those types of things. There's coaching and there's training. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think, um, and maybe you can speak a little bit more to this, but and it's one thing we've learned this year is we have really just over indexed in our onboarding process. Um, you know, I think we keep, it's two weeks long, similar to yours in just really working to prepare people to be successful. Uh, I think that goes back to that kind of the millennial thing is, you know, you you take these people and you're like, well, you know, just throw them out there with Bill and, you know, hey, Bill, let me know when he's ready to go on his own. What does that mean? And what's Uh, Bill's track record in life? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like is Bill doing things right or has he just been with you for a while? And he seems like a nice guy. You know, the other thing we learned too is like, you send them out with Bill and nothing bad against Bill. He could be a phenomenal electrician and have a lot of experience, but Bill is an electrician, not a trainer. Uh, So why are we expecting Bill to do all this training that we don't want to do and that, well, no one has time to do it and who's going to, you know, oversee it and all this stuff. But I think you bring up a great point is that we've really all got to get serious about our onboarding process and what that looks like. Tell, tell us a little bit more about what that, you know, the things you're going over. I know you mentioned kind of a boot camp, kind of exposing them to it, the production side of things. Tell, let's dive into that a little bit more because I think listeners can really gain a lot of like insight into what it really takes to prepare someone to be successful. Yeah. So our, our trades are known for, um, on like warm body hire, right? Like I'm just looking for a warm body to throw out there and uh, pacify something. We were tired of that because I don't, I don't know if you know your number. I think this is like probably one of the most important things for focusing on for your onboarding, for your hiring, for your growth is knowing the cost that it, that you lose when someone leaves within six months, that number is one of the most driving factors for, for having a good onboarding program. If you, if you don't know that, then, then don't worry about it. You just keep losing money somewhere. But I know that in six months, if I lose somebody, it costs me $14,000, one person. So is that worth the investment? Is it worth the fact that it's going to take two years, most likely before a guy is hitting at like an 85 to 95% rate organically, or can I, can I take that number and shorten that? And so if you can't get to that bigger picture understanding before you're onboarding, your onboarding are just going to be things you do that aren't going to really land any plane. So when we realized that, um, we said our culture and the people in it, like that matters the most. Um, one of our taglines is like, you can work at Ridgeline as long as you're not an asshole. Like that's simple. That's like, that's our start. <laughs> like that's our baseline. If you can pass that, we're, on, we're going the right direction. So the way we did that is we go into a, our first interview is a group interview and it's a cultural interview is what we call this. And I go in and I sit in that one. Uh, I'm not in a lot of the ones after that, but that first interview, I want to see the people who are going to represent that name of Ridgeline. I want to see the people who are going to fit with the team, whether I believe it or not. Um, and I usually sit in there with another person and we're just asking a lot of really weird questions. They don't make sense. It's really meant to like mess with their mind a little and just see how they respond to things. Like, how do you eat a bag of Skittles? I, that doesn't make sense. That's a weird question. But, and, and I don't know that there's an answer, but I'm looking for how people think. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for someone to go, why is he asking this question? And, and starting to work through that. And So through that whole interview, we're asking these types of questions, definitely geared towards like, what's the, uh, 
you like, tell me about a time that was like a really struggle, like you failed hard and how did you own it? And, and so we're looking for those kind of like story-based responses to see if they're going to fit. At the end of that, um, are you familiar with like the Fibonacci sequence? Oh. So it's just a random grouping of numbers for estimating. It's just kind of based on the idea that everybody really sucks at estimating. And so like, if I was like, hey, this task right here, is this a level five or a level six? You'd be like, I don't even know what the difference between those two are. The Fibonacci sequence is just a group of numbers that is like the next number is made up of the last two. So it'd be like one, two, one plus two is three, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight. So that whole sequence, it's just giving you the ability to rate things at a, a more like concise way. Um, so what we do after those, that cultural interview is we rate people on their tension level and we rate them like intention being, hey, we asked some weird questions. Did they struggle with them? Did they have instances in their life that were really hard and they overcame them? And so we're really looking for that because like I, I do get tired of being somebody's first time and, you know, they got a flat tire and called in and said, mom and dad said I shouldn't work right this far away. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like you, you need to be at work. I, I don't know where we go from here, man. Yeah. Um, so those, I was tired of those conversations. So we came to say if roughly they were under a certain age, since we can't know that, uh, but roughly we expected them to be under a certain age, they had to be at a certain tension level. And so, and also self-motivation level. We also kind of rated that based on that. And then at the end of all the interviews we do, we, everybody averages out their scores to see if they hit those baselines. So after the cultural interview, they go do a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, the cultural interview, I make it really like laid back. I cuss a bunch and it makes people like, oh, okay, great. Um, and the one-on-one -on -one interview, one of my partners comes in like in the nines, and just suit and tie looks, I mean, he may not suit and tie, but it throws people off. I want people being able to identify the environment they're in. So they come in, they experience that and then after that, we have them do a, um, it's called the Burke assessment, and it's a um, personality, behavioral, and cognitive assessment. And the cognitive is how I figure out that they fit the work. Do they have a certain spatial visualization? Do they have a logical problem-solving ability? And so we have certain ratings that show how good an electrician would be based on their spatial, their rapid problem-solving, their, their um, logical problem-solving and then it has like a vocabulary one, which is, is okay, but it's more to show that they're constant learners. They're more growth mindset than they are fixed mindset. So yeah, once we go through all that, then we offer, we don't offer. Is, uh, is Burke assessment, is that B-I-R-C? B-E-R-K-E. And I believe they just bought out or were bought out. Um, but I love it because it's like a one-time payment and you can run as many of them as you want instead of a lot of these personality assessments are like, hey, once you've got them, then it's worth spending $100 to see their EQ and some of these other things. Well, once you've got them, it's too late. You need to yeah. know beforehand whether they're going to connect to the work or not. And the times I didn't listen to it, like I, it's just a tool. I know that, but the times I didn't listen to it have bit me in the ass. So the one thing that I, I definitely want the listeners to understand, uh, and, and for a big reason of, I, I think you're just doing a phenomenal job at this. And it's something that we identified here recently that we've got to get better at. And that is interviewing people. Think about the last time you went into an interview and you said, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. How long have you been doing this? Okay. Sounds good. And then that, that's the end of the interview. Yeah. And I think what you're demonstrating is, is something we can all learn from is that finding great people is, isn't easy. Um, you've got to have a process for it. You've got to have things that allow you to make a really good decision because at the end of the day, what I always tell our managers is that, well, you were really excited to hire that person on day mm -hmm. one, weren't you? And day two was pretty good day three. And then all of a sudden, six months down the road, this guy's the biggest asshole I've ever met in my life. Well, yeah. 
hold on, he didn't transform into this person. He was always that person. We just failed on our end to recognize what he was truly about. And that's on us. If you, you know, I, I teach a lot of leadership and it's see the best in people and I'll have people come up to me and it's like, well, he's not any good or he can't do the job or she's terrible. I was like, well, whose fault's that? You hired him. Mm -hmm. If, if they're not, well, you're supposed to train them. And if they're not responding to your training, then maybe you get the wrong person. And maybe we need to go back to the drawing board as it relates to interviewing and onboarding uh, so that we do get the right person because yeah, it is virtually impossible to train just like you said, you can't get the wrong person on your team and try to run the, you know, the me growth and the personal train, like they won't buy in and mm -hmm. it's not going to work for them. Yeah. And this, you really like, we do this with every other part of our business is we think like investors, but we don't think like investors in the right way. When we think about our people, uh, Sinek's, Simon Sinek's book, the uh, infinite game, he talks about the will and the resource and it's fantastic, but his whole model is like, people are not a means to your product. They're part of your product. And so if they're part of your product, that's part of your investment. That's part of how you, like when you're looking at people, you have to have that investor mindset. Is this, this problem I'm seeing, um, is this a character-based problem or is this a maturity level problem? Because those are one of those I can, I can work with. The other one, it's it's going to take more time. And, and I'm with you. I like seeing the best in people. But I also, as an investor, know that if this is the road I'm on, this straight road here, and there are people off in the, the field, some of them are like 10 feet away and others are miles away. They can get to the road, but how long is it going to take to get to the road? And then are we both just going to be exhausted by the time they're there that it's like, nah, we just, this isn't a good fit. We're looking for people close to our road who match what we're about, what they're about. We, we want those people because that's a lot easier. You're going to have to get people to the road, though, regardless. There's not like people who are already running and they're like, oh, I'm already working for you. No, you have to find those people. You have to develop those people. But yeah, you have to have an investor mindset for that, too. Yeah, I really like that. What uh, Give us some examples. I like this, this uh, philosophy of investor mindset. I think that that, you know, when you start thinking about that, or in that frame of mind, um, you can make some different decisions. Tell, maybe give us an example of, uh, you know, a decision before you started looking at problems and it could be outside of the, the recruiting, onboarding, uh, you know, growing people type thing, but like the way you looked at a situation before and then the way you look at it now as it relates to kind of that investor mindset. Um, oh, well, I mean, I mean, onboarding period. There was a point mm -hmm. in time that I just thought that people should be a certain way, which is a very fixed mindset. And that if you didn't fit my way perfectly, then you weren't a good fit. Well, that's a like, how many people am I going to find that are exactly like me? I'm not going to find many. So therefore my ability to scale and grow is very minimal. Like it, it's going to top out every time and I'm going to have to stay in this business constantly. Whereas if we can come up with a model where we onboard the right people, we train them and develop them in the right way, I get to be out of the equation eventually. Um, and now this whole thing can continue to scale because it's paying attention to what it means when we do scale. How do we have to feed this model? Um, now, as the fact that I thought about this thing as an investor, as an investor mindset to grow people because they're part of the product, now I'm... I'm at the place where I hear everyone else in my industry saying, we need more people, we need more people, we need more people. I actually say I need more opportunity because that's like maybe now where my investor mindset needs to go is towards opportunities. I, I can get people. I develop people very quickly. Um, and I'm not worried about that part of the model anymore. Now I have to start looking elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that uh, I, I mentioned the uh, economic uh, meeting I was in last week. And it's like, you know, everybody's like, well, where did all these people go? Well, they didn't, they're still there, pretty sure. But we've got to understand that the, the burden is on us. I think too many times as businesses, we just want to go blame 
anything and everything. We want to blame economic conditions. We want to blame the fact that oh, I can't find any good people. If I hear that one more time, literally, you can't find any good people. Are you sure? Uh, there's plenty of good people out there, but we have to adjust our focus and, and realize that we're going to have to do more and we're going to have to do things differently. You know, you pointed out so perfectly that like people of, you know, of the past, well, they could go figure stuff out. Like they didn't take as much training and development and all of that stuff. Now, could they have benefited from it? Sure. But that just wasn't the, that wasn't the thing that they were exposed to. Whereas, you know, people of today, they can go find information at the, you know, Google. It's a great thing. Um, But it also uh, puts an interesting burden on us as, uh, you know, businesses is that we have to provide information for our people. Uh, they're coming to us as kind of that trusted mentor that like, Hey, you got all this information, like teach me, I'd love to be a part of your team. But like, if you don't teach me, I'm going to go find somebody else who can. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do believe we're in a labor crisis, but, and it's only because like we're in our, the last 10 years has been the lowest growth rate in U S history since the census began. So that's a real thing. Uh, we're about eight years out from 25 to 30% of our workforce retiring. That's a thing. And they're like the Mr. Miyagi's, right? They're not like the the brand new fellows. So there is a crisis. It's just the crisis is we've outfished our pond and we need to start building our farm league. And this is, this is, again, there's investor mindset. What does, what do the Yankees do? They've got farm leagues. What does every good, you know, funnel, corporation do is they, they build a farm league of some nature. If we're not doing that, we're missing out on those good people and developing those good people. And the thing I hear nonstop is, yeah, but if I train them, they're going to go elsewhere. Well, oh statistically, God. they're actually going to go elsewhere if you don't train them. Because if they don't see the ability to grow, there is a 60% chance more likely that they will leave because they're going to go look for that growth somewhere. So if they leave and you train them, who cares? You added value to a person at the end of life. Isn't that important? Okay, good. They went elsewhere and used it. So what? But the majority of the people I would imagine are going to stay. Yeah. And uh, if I train them, they're going to go elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, really? Like, really? Um, you know, if I shoot, I may miss. Well, Yes, fair. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but you may make it as well. Um, and That's the right. only way to make it is to shoot it. It's uh, I think your your point about, you know, fishing in different ponds is is a good one too. You know, there's, I, I've, I've always said, you know, when we started our school uh, about a year ago, uh, last October, we had over 700 applications for what was like 15 spots. And what I know is that now not all 700 plus of those were good candidates. Sure. Uh, But I'm sure that I could find 15 of them that were really good uh, had, you know, uh, if you have an interview process like you have an onboarding process, the curriculum behind it, develop the people, all of that stuff. And most of these people complaining out there need like a couple people. So, but You don't put any resources behind going to find these people in these other ponds. Yeah, we have outfished our own ponds. Like Mm -hmm. if the guy didn't work over there, he's probably not going to work at your place either. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I will say there are some that don't work at other places because the culture is terrible and you can expose them to a great place. Like they really blossom and, and we've you know, we try to push that as, Hey, this isn't that other place. So like, Mm -hmm. we're here to help you. But what, what are some of those things you're doing from a recruiting perspective? I think that's another thing that, that I'm super passionate about is if people are the, which for us, the most important, as you put it, part of your product, what are you doing to find them? Who's in charge of that? What, what are you doing? Or what are some things that you found successful uh, when it comes to recruiting? So, we actually do a lot less than you would imagine. Um, I don't do, I don't do uh, what's that one uh, website where not LinkedIn. Oh, uh, Indeed. Indeed. We don't do Indeed because you get the same people on every other platform who just are never happy no matter where they're at. That tends to be the case in the trades at least. 
we, we haven't really spent a whole lot of money on marketing for it either. It's honestly, I think it's just word of mouth. I think it's just, you know, I, I don't know who said this, but I, it's on one of my quote walls and it's uh, the best way to attract, attract top clients is to be in constant breakthrough. And you're going to find people who are hungry like you are when you're just constantly going on and talking about it and being excited about life and what you're doing. And so the majority of, I mean, we get one to two resumes a day and we're small, like we're a 40 people outfit. So we're not massive here. Um, but we still get this constantly and we log that stuff. And then when we have a cultural review, we just send out a, Hey, we're doing this. And then people show up. So I, I wish to say I had a, like, I, that is part of my Q1 goals this year is to come up with a good funnel that goes into the school systems and stuff like that too. But um, I think the first off, if, if you're not excited about this, people aren't going to be excited about this. If you're not in constant breakthrough, you can't expect anybody to outperform you. Um, as much as you're willing to put into all of this, it, nobody's ever going to be like, oh, I'll outdo the boss. No, they're just they're trying to be what you are. So um, I think you got to start there. But yeah, just friends of friends has been a big one for us. That's grown our, our workforce is that People are excited about our culture and our, our values and what we stand for. Um, and so they continue to bring people. And, and we do things to engage culture. We do quarterly outings, uh, whether that's going and playing broom ball on ice with your shoes and falling down and busting teeth out, or it's, you know, going and doing paintball against a competitor for fun. And like, we do these things because you do need that connection. And um, guys are just excited about that kind of stuff. And so they tell more people about it. And um, I mean, guys lo love on the cultural review name drop and who they know at the company. Uh, and I don't mind it either. So. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit more about this cultural review. What, 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 uh, what is that uh, that you guys are doing? So um, culture, first off, I, 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 love culture. I'm a big culture person, literally just published a book a couple of weeks ago, all on culture. Um, culture, we, we make it way too big. Like it's this animal and it's not, it's more like a forest. It's the environment, like simply put, it's just environment. Um, but we, we want to make sure that our environment is the right environment for the things to grow correctly. So if our product is, and our vision is what's going to grow, I need to make sure that our environment supports that. So our, we have a cultural quarterly review uh, that goes out and it's just asking about people's connection to the vision. It's checking to make sure that they're um, growing and they feel like they're growing, that they have opportunity, uh, that they're feeling appreciated. Now, it doesn't mean that like the environment is fluffy rainbows and unicorns because like when you think about environment, does a polar bear do better in the Midwest or in the Arctic? Does better in the Arctic because it's made for that type of environment. Well, that's what we're trying to make sure is that we have the right environment that's going to have the right amount of tension for their growth, but it's also going to be there supportive to help them grow in that process. So we're asking those kind of questions. We're asking for like, hey, do you feel like um, you're connecting with the people in the field? Do you feel like you're connecting to the actual hands-on that you're doing every day? And so it's a lot of those kind of reviews. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. Our cultural outings are more just connection based. Yeah. What's a, and I think this is a, a powerful piece the, the fact that you're asking for feedback is obviously critical. Uh, what, what are you doing with that feedback? So say you get some things back and, you know, oh, you know, I don't really like that. Like, Oh shoot, we're missing the boat here or whatever it may be. What, what are you doing? And both good too. Like, oh yeah, we're really, we're really knocking it out of the park with this. That initiative is really paying off. It seems what, what are you doing with that, uh, with that feedback that you get? What's your, what's your kind of management team doing with it? Yeah. So we, um, have you ever read the book Creativity Inc? No, I haven't. Oh man. Yeah. If I can drop one book today, it's that one. It's right. uh, the creators of Pixar. Um, okay. And it's the best business book. That's not really a business book I've ever read. Uh, and he talks, they talk in that about having a notes day, which is like one day where you bring everyone in and you just talk about your product. You talk about things like communication issues. You just bring it up. What are all 
like, let's talk about the good, bad, and ugly. It's basically like a huge SWOT analysis um, with everyone. And you have to believe that everyone has good ideas. And you have to believe that, um, you know, they said in that book, the one of the biggest things that the guy, the creator of Pixar realized when they finally released Toy Story is that everyone kept coming up and going, oh man, that was such a great idea, way to go. And they said it in such a way that it was like, oh, you just had that idea and it was there. And he was like, oh my gosh, that took like years upon years upon years to come to fruition. And he said, that's when I realized that no idea is singular. Like ideas are plural. They take thousands of different perspectives and decisions and whatever else to come to that ideal product. So we have that once a year notes day where we come in and it does not feel good. Like it sounds neat and exciting and it's fun. I love collaboration. But at the, on the other side of collaboration as a business owner is the reality of well, what the hell am I going to do with all this? And so, of course, there's that prioritization, figuring out what are the top three that I can take care of that are going to make up the majority of everything that was said. And so even while we were there on notes day um, and I had this whiteboard full <laughs> of issues, I was like, oh boy. I was able to take all those issues, circle them and bring them together and say, okay, here are really the three things that are an issue. Do you guys agree with this? And again, you're getting buy-in constantly because if they don't believe in what we're about to do and that have ownership in it, you're going to miss out. So we do all of that. And then we go to the executive team. We're uh, an EOS company. We have followed traction now for about a year and a half, two years. And we just put those as issues in each of the divisions. All right, all right, here's the issue. How are we going to solve this? Is this an issue worth solving or do we have bigger fish to fry? Um, so it, it really is prioritization. But if we really believe and can you know, prove to them that this is an issue that is going to affect the culture, that is going to affect the bigger vision that grows here, then it's worth taking care of. Uh, so do you do the notes days at just you and all the, without your kind of managers? They're there as well. They're there as well. Okay. Well, that's awesome. One of, our, that. one of our core values is we build trust through candor. And that just means that you're, everyone's allowed to, to speak freely. I mean, as long as the attacks are not personal, but are yeah, yeah. really about caring about the growth of the product, it's leaning into those hard times that actually grows anything anyway. So yeah, it hurt, <laughs> but yeah. I felt closer with my team after the fact. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of that healthy conflict uh, that they talk about in any business is, is good. You know, trading ideas, again, ideas are just that, Hey, this is a different way of doing something. Doesn't mean your way's wrong. Doesn't mean my way's right. It's just uh, Hey, maybe we can get to a better result here, or more efficient results or whatever it is. Um, and I think that the key there that, that I'd like the listeners to latch onto is while you're sharing that up front, regardless of when you share the information, I think the key is when you get any sort of feedback, you have to act. You have to show people that you care about their feedback, that you're listening, not just I'm doing a survey to say that I checked the box that I did the survey. Yeah. Um, one, okay. one thing that I've done in the past that's worked well is really taken and said, okay, these are the issues. Say for instance, it's in the plumbing department. Plumbing department, they respond to their quarterly survey. We do those as well. Actually, we just got the results back uh, today uh, on the quarterly survey. And you guys are saying that this is an issue and this is an issue. Well, okay, I'm not going to fix that. How do you want to fix it? What do you what yeah. What should we do in order to fix it? And there again, it goes back to your point of getting that buy-in of, and like I tell all my managers, I mean, this is a great time to be lazy, guys. This is a great time to be lazy. Yeah. Just show them what they said was wrong and then ask them how to fix it. You yeah. don't even have to come up with the answer. Just let them do it. Uh, all you got to do is, you know, remove a few roadblocks, maybe write up something here, talk to some other departments. You, you be that, as you said at the beginning, be that guide, let them be the hero. Hey, yeah. we fixed this problem. I told you we figure it out. All right, cool. Sounds like a plan. Let's move on to the next one. I don't want to be the genius in the room. Yeah. Like Part of, I think good leadership is being a genius manager, not the genius. Yep, exactly. Well, Blake, I think we could probably talk all day um, about this stuff, but I want to be respectful for your time. Obviously, just a ton of great stuff. 
in here. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of time just to kind of plug your stuff. Obviously, as you said, um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, but uh, you did just release uh, your book. Um, you've got the podcast going on. You've got an incredible company. You're doing some really awesome things. What's one thing you would leave the listeners with uh, as we as we wrap up today? And then if you'd like, you know, kind of let us know where we can get your book, listen to the podcast, all of that stuff, if they'd like to uh, like to do some more digging into what, what you're doing there at Ridgeline. Yeah. I, I think the thing I would leave everyone with is just the simple idea that your people are not a means to your product. They are a part of your product. You can't go to a restaurant and just get the food without the people, right? And whether you had a good experience or not at that restaurant, had probably 30 different people involved. It was a host, it was a waiter, was whether they were timely or not. Did they fill your drink up in time? That's a big one for me. You know, like, did the food come out well? Was it tasty? Like there's so many different parts of that one experience. And if, if you just think that it's just the food, you're missing it. It is the people that actually produce and are part of that product that really matter. So that would be the one thing I would leave them with. Um, the book is Uncultured, the key to prevent your team from self-destructing. You can get it at Amazon um, and it's there on, I think it's going to release on Audible soon. They keep telling me that they've got some long lead times, I guess. I, I don't know. I guess COVID or something happened. And uh, yeah, you can get a paperback, a digital copy there. And then our podcast is on all major podcast uh, platforms. And what's the name of the podcast? The Ridgeline Leadership Podcast. And awesome. our podcast focus is all about, you know, there are so many leadership podcasts out there that are there for leaders to get better. And that's a great place to be. But I think there's also a platform for people who are like, I don't even know how to walk into leadership period. And so again, with our heart and development and training people and creating those mindsets early, ours, our leadership podcast is really for those who are like aspiring to be leaders. That's awesome. I love that focus. Cause yeah, you, you meet so many people like, I'd love to do this, but I don't even know where to start again, Blake. I can't thank you enough. Uh, obviously encourage all the listeners to uh, go grab a copy of that book and listen to the podcast. I've caught a few episodes, just really great stuff. You know, as we wrap up here, I, I think that there's just so much that you can grab here, but you know, as you said, and, and the one thing that I have circled on my notes is, you know, that people are the part of your product, uh, not a means to it. And I think if we can all think of that, the next time that we interview somebody, the next time that we onboard somebody, what would it look like if they, if you viewed them as part of your product? You know, Sarah over there, or Bill over there, or whatever that you just brought on, you're super excited about if you looked at them as part of your product, what would that look like? How would your actions change? I just can't think um, that things would be a whole lot better if we viewed them that way. Again, Blake, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time. Appreciate you sharing all the wonderful things that you are doing there at your company. I know that they will help somebody. Um, to all of you out there, um, take something from this podcast, take it and put it into your business so that you can help grow your people. Again, always keep growing out there. And until next time, we'll see you.